Hi everyone. Uh, is it all good? Hi everyone. Um, I'm Maxim. I work at Baylibre, and um, this is upstream multimedia on analogic SOCs from fiction to reality. So last year, my colleague Neil Armstrong gave a talk about mainline Linux status on analogic SOCs, and this is kind of a follow-up to this to this talk, except that it's going to be uh, much more focused on the multimedia stuff which is going to be video decoding and video rendering on such SOCs. So um, here's the list of topics that we're going to see here. Uh, a quick, a very brief analogic multimedia status on mainline Linux. Uh, then I'll talk about how I implemented a v 2 memory-to-memory video decoder driver for the analogic SOCs. Uh, then we'll talk about <coughs> the current user space developments to do decoder to display pipelines on the mainline kernel. Uh, and finally, we'll have a quick demo to show what we can do uh, on such a board. So uh, on the display side, uh, we have a DRM KMS driver uh, for most of the newer SOCs from MLogic. We have a GMI and composite output support uh, and a primary RGB plane with alpha support. Um, and in progress, we have the 4K uh, HDMI 1.4 mode as well as YUV overlaying plane support. Uh, we still don't have support for HDMI 2.0, HDR, 10-bit color output, and all this great stuff, but we really want to get that as well. Uh, CEC, so CEC is a uh, protocol within HDMI that allows you to control like with one IR remote, both your TV and your box, or to control your TV from your uh, setup box, uh, etc. And we have support for that in the main kernel already. Uh, when it comes to audio, so Amlogic has a new range of SOCs called uh, the A A113, and it's um, it is an SOC that is dedicated to smart speakers. And for example, the Google Home Max uh, has one of those SOCs in it, and um, we have uh, mainline support for SOC Alza SOC on these SOCs. Um, all right, so implementing a v 2 memory-to-memory video decoder driver for analogic SOCs. This is what I did in the past six months. Um, I start, so I started six months ago. I was uh, without a job, and um, I had never really contributed anything to open source. So I figured, uh, why not, let's do it. Let's take some time to just do this, do this right, and take some time to do it. So I looked on my shelf, and there was a Raspberry Pi and an Android C1. And the Android C1 runs on an Amlogic S805 SOC. Uh, and uh, so I went to see the Amlogic community and to see what was missing in mainline kernel. And I saw that they had no support for video decoding yet. And video decoding on these chips is great. So, um, sorry. So I figured I'll just jump into it. So. Before we get into the, the technical details, I'll talk just a little bit about the v 2 and the memory-to-memory -memory stack. So Video for Linux 2, uh, it's a kernel framework for many media drivers, so uh, camera drivers, display drivers, and video accelerators, which are hardware video decoders and encoders. Um, Memory-to-memory -memory simply means that both the input of the driver and the output are in RAM. Uh, the device nodes that you get for such devices are usually uh, dev video 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And it, uh, the vi video decoding using this framework is increasingly supported for many SOCs on the market. Uh, some of them are still uh, work in progress, but the, it's really getting together. So when it comes to hardware video decoders, you can have two kinds of them. Uh, you have the stateful hardware video decoders, so they have a hardware bitstream parser. So the, the video bitstream is like the raw compressed uh, data, like an H.264 uh, bitstream. Um, and so such stateful video decoders have already in hardware or in firmware a, a bitstream parser to get all the data, and they are autonomous in this way. You don't need to control them much from the driver. Um, and uh, for example, the Amlogic uh, one is stateful. It has firmware and uh, a bitstream parser. Stateless video decoders, on the other hand, 
they only have the decoding logic, but you really need uh, to keep the state and to parse the bitstream from either user space or not from uh, in, not in hardware. So, for instance, there is all the great work done by the bootling, bootling guys uh, on the all winner VPU at the moment, as well as the VFL2 request API that are being pushed at the moment for 420, I think. And so, yeah, but the M logic one is not stateless. Um, here are a few, here's a, a little slide about all the video decoding capabilities that you can find on such SOCs. Uh, the uh, Le Potato board, which is the one we distributed yesterday, is an S805X, so it can do pretty much, pretty much everything. So when you want to write, uh, when you want to write such a driver, um, you start looking at what you have available. So Amlogic is pretty good on the open source side, which means that they don't contribute that much to mainline kernel and mainline U-boots, but they do give out periodic updates to of their vendor kernel, like many SOC vendors do. And they have a custom driver for their video decoder. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a lot of lines. I didn't count them all. I just counted the ones that, uh, that I cared about. But uh, it's a non-standard non -standard API, like custom IO controls. It, uh, it, it's controlled by a uh, user space binary blob. And um, it has an in-kernel media player logic, which means that using this driver, you go straight from the, from the decoder to the display inside the kernel, and there is no user space uh, action at all. So it's not, it's not that great. Uh, but it works great for their uh, only supported use case, which is Android, of course. So where do you start when you want to write a mainline driver for such uh, an IP? Uh, you need to look at uh, how do you set up the power for the IP, how do you find the clocks that uh, feed the IP, the RAQs. Uh, if there is firmware, in our case there is, uh, where are the firmware files? Um, how do you write the bitstream to the IP? How, you, how do you get the decoded frames back from the decoder? And uh, how much is in the vendor kernel and how much is hidden in the user space binary blob that controls the driver? Uh, so all that you have to figure out uh, early. So clocks, this is what you can find in the vendor kernel. It's, uh, you know, just macros that write directly to clock registers to set them up. So the right way to do it in mainline kernel is to rewrite all this as the, uh, into the clock framework, uh, which wor works great. Firmwares are fortunately uh, in, still, still in the vendor kernel. This is um, in kernel firmwares in header files. So you just have to dump those arrays to files and you get the firmware, it's pretty easy. Uh, one nice thing about this is that those header files are uh, licensed under GPL, so you can redistribute the firmware as you like, which is pretty, pretty nifty. Um, how do you write the bitstream to the video decoder? So what happens is you, you get uh, the bitstream from uh, like a container, like an MP4 file, an MKV file, or from a remote source. And you need to write that bit stream into the uh, elementary stream parser, which is a hardware uh, unit in the video decoder. So you get your input buffer, you write it to the ES parser, it writes it into a video FIFO, which is in this case 16 millibytes, but it can change. Um, so I start doing that like the vendor kernel does, but I get no IRQ from the parser, like I get nothing. But the, the buffer is written, but I get no RAQ. Uh, it turns out you need to do a, 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 some small hacks to the input buffer to get the RAQ. Uh, the first hack is to write a fake start code at the end of the input buffer. So in, in a bit stream, you, you usually always have a start code followed by uh, an important packet, or well, any packet of any kind. Uh, and the parser will, will refuse to give you an RAQ until you give it another start code at the end of the buffer. And you also need to pad it to at least four kibibytes, otherwise it doesn't work as well. Retrieving the decoded frames from the decoder. So I was looking into the vendor kernel source code, and when you want to see where they write the frames, you want really to look for some like buffer phi at ADR, uh, like the physical address of the buffers, you want to see where they write it. Uh, and I couldn't find anything like, 
at all. And I was wondering really, how do they, write, how do they uh, tell the decoder, you have to write the frames here, here, here. Uh, it turns out there is another IP in the SOC called the Canvas IP. And it's a, it's a video lookup table where you would say, uh, all right, this buffer, uh, it's Canvas ID zero, it has this resolution, uh, this buffer physical address, finally there it was written, and block mode and Indianus. Uh, and on the decoder side, you just say, all right, I have my frame number zero, it's Y plane is linked to canvas number zero, and you just write basically the, um, the canvas indexes into the decoder. It doesn't care about the actual physical addresses. So this is a, a very high overview of uh, how the video decoder works. So you can see it goes from the top to bottom. Uh, you, you write the packets into the elementary stream parser. It feeds the, vi the video FIFO with it. And then the firmware CPU and the, the decoder IP work together to decode the frames. Uh, the, the frames uh, buffer addresses are, are, get, are um, gotten from the canvas IP. And then we get finally our decoded frames. So um, before seeing what it looks like, uh, how do you test uh, a VFOL2 memory to memory uh, decoder? Because it, it turns out that uh, the, um, it's not that easy from user space to set up a VFOL2 M2M decoder. Like there is a lot of uh, steps in the VFOL2 framework. Uh, fortunately, there are already a few open source implementations that allow you to use a video decoder via VFOL2. So the first one is uh, the implementation in FFmpeg. It is by far the one that I use the most. Uh, it's, a very, it's a great tool. Uh, the implementation is, uh, works great. And um, so the, the, the FFmpeg command that you can see here just uses the video decoder to dump the raw frames. And it's one line. It's really, really great. GStreamer also has a, a VFOL2 video decoding uh, implementation. Uh, which you can use like so. I didn't use it as much as FMPEG, but it does work. Um, the third option that I really use the least because it's a pain to set up uh, is to use Chromium because Chromium also has its own VFOL2 implementation. It's not really designed for Linux at, at the start because uh, they made it for their Chrome OS devices. Uh, but fortunately, the guys from Igalia, which are the guys porting uh, Chromium to Ozone Wayland, uh, they also made some patches to be able to use VFOL2 decoding on Chromium, and it, it, works, it works pretty well. So, finally, I run a FMPEG, um, and it gives, me, it gives me one frame, and I'm like, great. <laughs> so, this is the first frame I got, and at the time, I thought that uh, my, my implementation, my driver, was completely borked, because uh, th there's no way this is right. Well. This is actually a very healthy frame. Uh, this is totally what you, you should expect uh, because this is a tied frame. So what happens is that this is very, very common for video decoders to not use uh, standard planar uh, pixel formats. Instead, they use tiled formats. Uh, the reason they do this is because a video decoder has a very specific way of accessing pixels and you want to have as, as, as few cache misses and, as, and the best pixel locality as possible uh, in memory. And a tile mode is a good way to do that. So it's basically, basically to enhance performance of the video decoder. But, uh, so you have two solutions when you're faced with a pixel format like this. Either you support it, so you, you add the documentation to describe it in the kernel. Uh, you add uh, a new fork, a new 4CC. And uh, you make sure that that 4CC is supported in FMPEG, in Kodi, in the media players, and in, in the DRMK MS drivers as well, if you want to render them. Uh, but I wanted to see if we could get like a regular pixel format out of this, and not this tiled format. Uh, and it turns out, uh, if you remember my slide about the canvas IP, uh, there is a field called block mode. And this block mode can actually be 64 by 32, which is this one. It can be 32 by 32, or it can be linear. So this is linear. We're not there yet, but it looks better, right? Um, 
So we now have a linear plan, uh, multi-planar image, but every eight, every eight pixels are like reversed. And uh, I really thought that uh, this is the best that we could get for like two weeks until I think it was Nicolas Dufresne from uh, Collabora. Um, he told me that he found another field in the Canvas IP called the NDNS. Uh, I was looking at an old vendor kernel and that didn't have this field, so I didn't know this even existed. And he basically tested it and told me, yeah, if I write uh, into the NDNS field uh, this value, uh, you get proper NV12. So um, uh, we were finally able to get proper frames out of the decoder. Uh, this was maybe two, two months two month after having started the, all the work on the decoder. And finally, we could decode frames. So this, this is from the Sintel uh, open movie. Um, so we have frames. Now what? Uh, well, now we need to render them, preferably with good performance. So let's talk a bit about DRM, kernel mode setting, uh, and DM above before we actually uh, talk about rendering them. So a DRM driver, um, is, this is a very high overview of a DRM KMS driver. On the very left, you can see that you can use a DRM frame buffer. This is if you're doing the old way, the um, emulated frame buffer way. Uh, but what interests us is the plane, the planes mode that are uh, below the CRTC. Planes, um, many, many of these uh, SOCs have multiple hardware planes. And what you can do is you can write different buffers to these planes, and then you have a CRTC which just merges all these planes together uh, to get the final image that you send to your TV. Um, so yeah, the, the DRM plane abstraction, it allows you to do a pixel format conversion. Um, you can do alpha blending, so you can have a plane on top that is transparent with a plane behind that has the video, for example, uh, etc. So this is a good way to visualize it. Uh, in this use case, we have two planes on the left. We have an NV12 plane uh, that we fill with the video from the decoder. It's in, it's, a 4K, it's in 4K resolution. And on the bottom, we have a 1080p RGB plane that has the UI with the play, pause button, the subtitles, etc. And then uh, all we have to do is to just fill those planes. Uh, and then the DRM driver will set it up so that the bottom plane is upscaled. The pixel formats are converted. There is alpha blending so that the UI plane doesn't cover the whole video. Uh, and finally, what you get on screen is the whole merge of these two, of these two planes on the right. Um, another thing that I want to talk about before talking about rendering techniques is uh, sharing buffer with DMA buff. So DMA buff, it is a kernel framework that, that allows you to share physical buffers between devices. For example, you can share a buffer that you get from the video decoder and you can send it to the DRM KMS display driver. Uh, it uses file descriptors and so it's, it's a very easy framework. Uh, you can either consumer import the buffers or pro the producers, such as the video decoder, they export the buffer. In the case of V4L2, there is an IO control called video XPBuff that allows you to export a DM above file descriptors. Um, so there are two techniques to do rendering in, the, uh, in zero copy right, as of right now. Uh, the first one is to use DRM prime. Uh, DRM prime is the one where you write to a plane that supports the pixel format of the frame. Uh, you write it, you, you send it the, the DMA buff uh, file descriptor directly. And the other one is to import the, the DMA buff uh, frames from the decoder into the GPU with an EGL extension. So we'll see those two in details. So this is DRM Prime. So we have our media player that sits in user space, such as a Kodi, MPV, or whatever. And it exports the DMA buff frame descriptors using VDRK XP buff from the V4L2 decoder. And then, so it renders the UI as usual using the GPU, for instance, uh, on the RGB plane. Uh, but on the DRM plane that supports the video, 
you just use a call called DRM mode add FB2. Uh, there is a newer version called DRM mode add FB2 with modifiers, I think, but in this case, we use this one. And uh, this allows you to write the, the DMA buff file descriptors to the DRM plane directly. So this is how you do zero copy, decoding and rendering uh, with a media player from user space. Um, the other method, with method which is also zero copy, is to use only the GPU and to do everything with the GPU. And in that case, you still export the buffer from the decoder with the same IO control. Uh, and there is an EGL extension uh, called EGL Linux DMA buff EXT, which allows you to import uh, a frame buffer into the GPU. And so you can render everything via the GPU on the same plane, if you only have one plane, for example. Um, yeah, so this is a, a short overview of what the, what the players support right now and uh, the pipeline players, um, in case anyone is, uh, is interested. Uh, here are a few resources. So um, Liberlec, it is a Linux distribution that defines itself as just enough OS for Kodi. Kodi is probably the better known media player out there. Uh, Many people buy, buy such boards to just run Kodi on it at the end of the day. We also have an open embedded MetaMason layer if you want to build images for such uh, SOCs. And we have all the patches that are not mainline yet, such as the video decoder and the NV12 plane, etc., uh, and some communications. And before, we, before I show you a little demo of what all this work gives on the mainline kernel, uh, I want to say thanks to the Linux and Logic community that I joined six months ago when I started this work. Uh, great people, the VFOL community, great people as well. Uh, the Liberlake community helped me a lot. Thanks a lot to them and uh, yeah. And so now, uh, demo. <laughs> so I'm just going to set up the board. Hopefully, all this works well. <laughs> so this is Liberlake. This is running a mainline kernel with a few patches, obviously. Uh, we, are we are doing our best to mainline this work. Uh, there are some patch series already in the mailing list, um, but it's not there yet. So yeah, this is Cody on the mainline kernel uh, with my video recorder and the planes from, uh, and the DRM work from Neil Armstrong. And uh, so I have a few, a few video files here. So the first one is a 1080p, 60 frames per second, H.264 file. is the very infamous Big Bug Bunny um, uh, demo, a vi video from Blender, I think. And you can see in the debug information that we are using the H.264 V4 2 memory to memory hardware decoder uh, from FMPEG. And we are using DRM Prime as a rendering technique. So this is zero copy DRM Prime, DRM Prime rendering. Um, yeah, getting it short. Uh, this is a, an HEVC 8-bit file, 1080p. Um, so the, the jellyfish test samples are pretty great. There is a website that has all of them, and it's uh, they have them in all kinds of formats and bit rates and whatnot. Uh, it's pretty nifty. So oh, yeah, nice, nice jellyfishes. <laughs> um, this one is 4K HEVC 10-bit, which we also support. So um, uh, the the output is 8-bit colors, but this is still still decoded in 10-bit color modes. It's the same sample, so you have to trust me. Uh, <laughs> At least the resolution doesn't like doesn't lie here. Um, and the CPU usage remains pretty low. I don't know if you can see, but 
it's okay. It's all in hardware. And an MPEG-2, uh, just for uh, completeness, let's say. Um, I, haven't do, I haven't done any seeking yet because seeking doesn't work, uh, so don't ask me to try to seek because it will just crash the board, but uh, yeah. All right, so this is what we can do. Uh, I just have another very quick demo. Oh, crap. I hope, I hope I can get it to work. It should be fine. All right. All right. So, by the way, this is still on a on a on a potato on a potato board. Uh, and it didn't work, did it? Oh, it does, it does, perfect. So this is Weston, and this is the reference Wayland uh, compositor, and, um, but it, this is not what's really interesting here. What we have is Chromium on Wayland, on such a board, but more importantly, thanks to the work from the Igal Igalia guys, uh, full screen, uh, I was able to set up pretty easily VFOL2 hardware decoding on Chromium on Wayland. So this is the same 1080p 60A CC frames per second file from earlier. And uh, works pretty great. It's not as smooth as Kodi, but it's, it works okay. Um, I don't think we have network here, so I can't show you, I can't show you YouTube or anything, but, but yeah. Um, if you don't trust me, I can like flip it back into software decoding and show you how sluggish it is. Uh, but yeah, the, this is hardware decoding on Chromium Wayland with Refoil 2. Uh, it's all still very bleeding edge, still a lot of patches that are not mainline in any project, but uh, it's, it's promising. Like I think this is the Refoil 2 decoding and DRM rendering and etc. cetera. It's, uh, it's definitely the future for Linux embedded. So. Uh, that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh. Um, any plans to work on video encoding? So, yes, hopefully. Um, <laughs> those, those chips support H.264 encoding, JPEG encoding, and some of the newer ones support HEVC encoding, uh, but there is no work yet towards it. We hope to be able to do it in the future, but it will depend on, obviously, funding, and if I get some time from it from Belibre. Uh, so I can't promise anything, but video encoding would be great, sure. Yeah. So, uh, do you prefer the GPU compositing of the video and uh, the Chrome, or do you prefer to use the uh, scan-out engine with multiple planes to do that compositing? Which one is better? Uh, DRM Prime with multiple planes is better, in my opinion, because you, you, what you do here is that you need to scale using shaders, and so you stress the GPU a lot just to do basic stuff. Uh, but if you use the ARM Prime, then you use the scaler from the display IP, and uh, you, the GPU has much less stress on it. So overall, the DRM Prime, if you can do it, it's better. Um, but if you're in an EGL environment like Wayland, sometimes you don't have a choice, and you must do everything using EGL and the GPU. Uh -huh. So in that case, Chromium, for example, this is EGL rendering. This is not DRM Prime on Chromium. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Uh, you presented a zero copy way to uh, render a, to render the frames, yeah. and I was wondering why does the 4K uh, 
a movie is consuming three times the CPU rather than uh, the Full HD or the 720p. Where is the CPU is consumed in? Uh, what is the difference in CPU consumption between a Full HD and 4K rendering? Well, there shouldn't be any in theory. Um, did you see? Did you see that it was different? Yes, it was 40 percent when you were oh. rendering the 4K, and it was a uh, 10 or 14. Oh, for maybe the because HD. on the left there was the the system memory usage, and then you had like the four CPU that were updated. But if you saw only one value, that it was the, the memory usage, I think. Oh, maybe, maybe I missed. Okay. The, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because uh, when you're doing 4K decoding, obviously the memory usage goes sky, sky high. Uh, but this is something uh, that can be optimized for sure. But for now, it just takes a lot of memory. Yeah. So for the Amlogic S905X boards, um, the memory bandwidth is 32-bit DDR, running at uh, around uh, 2 gigahertz. So uh, the amount of bandwidth you need for 4K is basically at the edge of what 32-bit DDR can provide. And so there are platforms with 64-bit DDR that can like actually do like 4K frame buffers. So this actually uses like some frame buffer compression techniques in order to display the video at 4K uh, on that limited memory bandwidth. So when you see that 4K running at higher CPU load, part of that is the memory bandwidth consumption. So and the latency associated with the the transfers. So, congrats. Um, any other question? All right, thank you very much.